thank you very much. So I want to continue my course from yesterday. So yesterday I explained that somehow every localizing invariant satisfies, like for example, uh, Nisnevich descent or Tsarisky descent. So this allows you to reduce questions to local rings, for instance. Um, and um, but somehow one, one thing, if you want to study um, uh, singularities of a scheme, for example, then then usually it's not enough to to consider just Tsarisky or Nesnevich coverings, and and you need something more general, which is the CDH coverings or or, or in the simplest case, let's say uh, closed coverings. So let's start with a typical example, um, which will also come up in in Elden's talk again, I think, um, and that's that's the nodal curve. So we we fix some. Um, let's say field k, and then we look at the at the nodal curve over this. So that's k x y mod uh, y squared minus x cubed minus x squared. So this looks like um, looks like this. And and then uh, so so the idea how to study this is to to decompose this here somehow. So this has uh, you can look at the normalization, which is just an a one. So it's an it's an affine line. Um, and then the singular point here, this has two pre-images. And um, if you glue these two, Im these two points to one, then you precisely get this, this nodal curve here. And this translates somehow into, into the following statement about rings. So you have a um, Cartesian square. So in case of characteristic not to otherwise not. Ah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, so you get a Cartesian square of rings um, where this A here, this, this now sits in a pull. Okay, maybe my orientation is now a bit different. So here's A, then we have A1. So that's the, well, let me also try to keep the same kind of K. So that's a polynomial, polynomial ring in one variable. And then here we have the evaluation map at uh, uh, minus one and one, let's say. This goes to k times k, and uh, here you have the evaluation at the singular point, and this maps diagonally uh, into this product. And here, okay, so now you observe this is this is a Cartesian square of rings, and also these these vertical maps here they are surjective. That's precisely where you use that the characteristic is not two, otherwise this would not, this map here would somehow land in the diagonal. Okay, so so these are surjective. And uh, of course, these three rings here are somehow um, much simpler than this original ring A here. So this is a Cartesian square. And now you can ask, can you somehow, um, somehow say something about the K-theory or any localizing invariant evaluated on perf of A, if you know it on these other three um, simpler looking corners, okay? And uh, so this is a typical, Example for a so-called Milner square. So let me. Okay, now I. So I will usually use. Let me see this notation. Yeah, a prime. This will be b, and this is b prime. So any such pullback square where the vertical maps are as objections, this is called. They are called Milner squares. Um, And some are actually historically, some of these were the first cases where one, one had some kind of descent statement. So this was already proven by, by Bass, or, uh, Bass and Milner and Murphy. Uh, the, the following theorem that um, that's from the 60s. That whenever you have such a Milner square, you get a long exact sequence. So, so for every Milner square as above. Uh, we get a long exact, long exact sequence of k groups, so which, which starts at k1, k1 of a goes to k1 of a prime plus k1 of uh, b, then k1 of uh, b prime, and then the, you have some boundary map which goes to k naught of this ring a, and then this continues in fact to arbitrary negative degrees here. So. So this continues infinitely to the right, this long exact sequence. Okay. So using this, for example, it's easy to, to compute the, 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 the zeros and, and negative, the non-positive k groups of this ring A here. Okay. So this, this is quite useful. And, and some, some, somehow it was, I mean, people tried to, to extend this to the left. I mean, this was even known before, before k2 was invented in the higher k groups. And, uh, 
but then somehow Swan proved that you cannot extend this, this sequence to the left here, not, at least not in a functorial day. So this, this does, not ex, uh, does not extend to the left uh, with, I mean, uh, K2, yeah, let's say dot dot dot, K2 of uh, B prime to K2 of, uh, yeah, sorry, to K1 of A. Okay, um, so this 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 is a problem. So in general, we don't we do this this square will not give a pullback square of K theory spectra, and um, and now I want to discuss the following um, theorem that I obtained together with Markus Lund. Uh, yeah, uh, which sa says the following. So whenever you have such a Milner square. Somehow you have to, you can replace this ring B prime here by some derived ring. And then for this derived ring, you will get a pullback square of K theory. And in fact, for any localizing invariant. And um, so you see some of these derived rings show up um, naturally. And in fact, the whole statement is also valid for derived rings or more generally for ring spectra. So uh, let's consider a square box as before. A a prime, B, B prime. And now these are allowed to be ring spectra. Oops. So this is a Cartesian square. Um, of and by ring spectrum, I always mean E one. So so a coherently associative ring spectrum. And, and note that every Milner square here is in particular an example. So you can view any discrete ring as a ring spectrum. And, and then this condition here, somehow that this is, that this is a pullback, plus that the, these two maps here that you have are jointly surjective, which is a bit weaker than just one, one map being surjective, precisely says that the, this, the square, if you view it as a square of ring spectra, is Cartesian. Okay. Um, and then, so, so the, the assertion is then there's a, so there's a naturally associated oh, ring spectrum uh, C, and if if we uh, need to to make clear the dependence on this diagram, then we write it like this: A, and then O O dot uh, sorry A prime O dot over A and under B prime with B, uh, which fits in the following diagram, also and a commutative diagram. Uh, um, so we have this original diagram, A to uh, A prime to B, and then we can, can put a C here. And the original diagram still is here outside. And there also always exists a map from the C to B prime. And this, this inner square also commutes. Let's give this a name, hashtag. And, and now the, the property is somehow that this inner, inner square is taken to a pullback square by any localizing invariant. So such that, that uh, okay, let me continue here. Any localizing invariant um, takes. Okay, so so before localizing invariants are something defined on on idempotent complete small stable infinity categories, and I evaluate them in general on any I mean ring spectrum or whatever just by first passing to perfect uh, complexes over this ring spectrum. So let me write this once maybe so we tag perf of this inner square hashtag um, and then this is uh, this is taken to a Cartesian square of spectra um, yeah okay 
So, so this means you get now long exact sequences of homotopy groups. Um, for example, if you do this with K theory, which relates the K theory of A, A prime B, and this new thing C. Okay, this might not uh, seem so helpful unless you know something more about the C, and in, indeed we do. So, so moreover, um, so the underlying spectrum. Of C, yes. So what is it? Um, I mean, okay, this is some ring spectrum. You can look at the underlying spectrum, so without the ring structure. And then it turns out this is just the derived tensor product uh, of A prime, and this is somehow where the notation comes from. You just look at the this upper um, span or co-span here, A A prime B. You view A prime and B as A modules, a left module and a right module, and then you can take the, the derived tensor product. Is it the same as the derived uh, in the opposite order? That is when you view it as a left? Uh, no, no, no. I don't, so, yes, <laughs> good question. I, I, I don't think that's true in general. And this really depends somehow on the choice of orientation of this diagram. So if you, if you flip the diagram, you get a different ring C. And I think in, in, in general, they, they even uh, will not be equivalent. Um, uh, yeah, so, so this is the derived tensor product. So I didn't put an L here because somehow uh, that's the only thing that makes sense in the setting, derived things. Um, okay, and, I, and, also, uh, and also all these maps that you have there are the canonical ones. So the underlying maps of spectra, for example, from A prime to C, this is just given by the inclusion in the first tensor component. So, so uh, A maps to A tensor one. So, and also the map to B prime, this is just given by multiplying together the two things um, to B prime. Okay, uh, so what, what does this help? So note. Uh, so, so the plan is to, I will first um, discuss some, some applications of this theorem and then I would like to indicate how you, how you prove this. Um, so let's first discuss applications to this problem of, of Milner squares, this original excision problem. Ah yeah, by the way, this, this theorem here by Bass, Milner and Murthy, this, this is called excision, so this is where this name comes from. Um, so, so assume that A yeah, so all these rings A, A prime, B and B prime are discrete. Then we see, so if, in particular in this case of a Milner square, so if box is a Milner square, um, then we have the derived tensor products of these rings. So we, we just we can compute the homotopy groups of the spectrum C. So these are just Tor groups. Um, under A of A prime and B. So you see, you see, you get some, some higher Tor groups in general, and, and the pi zero of C, uh, this, this you have to compute once if, um, so this is just the ordinary tensor product, of course, and this turns out to be just this ring B prime, precisely in this setting where one of these maps is surjective. This is not true in, in more general situations. Okay. Um, Okay, so this, so this is an observation, and then you see, for example, this, uh, so just as, as an example application, um, uh, there, there's one thing that, that is somehow specific for K-theory, so if you have, you can evaluate it on, on a connective ring spectrum, and then the uh, K-groups in degrees one and less just depend on pi naught of this ring spectrum. And in general, somehow the, the K-theory is, is, so increases connectivity by one, so if you have an N-connective, or whatever. If you look at Kn, this only depends on the uh, n plus one truncation of your ring spectrum. So, so what I want to say here is yes. What was, was the question? Minus one truncation. Uh, yes. Thanks. The n minus one truncation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right. Thanks. So, so this gives um, so applying K theory. Uh, K uh, gives the. Um, gives this uh, bus uh, Milner and Murthy uh, theorem in, in low degrees and also explains somehow what, why this does not extend, I mean this, this what Swan proved, uh, this does not extend to K2 because K2, what you should put there is K2 of C 
and and if this if this ring here has the C has a pi uh, has a pi one, so if there's some tor group appears, then a priori this this k groups will be different. Okay, um, good. Uh, okay, ah, maybe I should should also say some of this. Uh, so there was a, there's a lot of work on this question. Uh, there, there was a lot of work on this question when some when, for example, maybe some some specific Milner squares. Uh, um, you can you can consider specific Milner squares and consider their K theory, and ask maybe this is a Cartesian square. You can put some conditions on the Milner square, so mainly by by Suslin and and Wojcicki. and um, and this somehow uses completely different techniques to to what I have explained yesterday. And somehow one of the motivating uh, questions for before this theorem was somehow uh, why can't you use this 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 nice machinery of localizing invariance and so on to to treat these kind of problems, and and in fact you can as I will explain later. Okay, but uh, let me uh, first uh, collect some applications that will also be used in in Ellen's course at least partly. Uh, so. So you see, I mean, this this theorem works for any localizing invariant, and as I said, somehow, if you, if you want to see, let's let's just consider Milner squares. If you want to, see, to know something about it, the original Milner square, the point what you have to understand is the the what this map from C to B prime does on your localizing invariant, and and here we have seen that for Milner squares, this map is just the map that sends that somehow the, the canonical truncation or the map to pi zero of of a connective ring spectrum. Um, so, so there are some inver localizing invariants which do not see this this difference at all, and then you see you get some excision for free. So, so these get a name. So, definition: uh, localizing invariant um, E is called truncating. Um, Uh, if e from uh, e of the, the canonical map of from e of c to ah yeah uh, e of uh, pi naught of c uh, is an equivalence for every connective ring spectrum. Uh, c. And here uh, by C, I mean uh, by E of C, uh, as indicated before, E of C is just by definition uh, E of perf of C. So this doesn't imply, so maybe, so if you have a possibly non connective ring spectrum, can you uh, truncate it to get rid of the higher homotopy and get similar thing or not? You can, I mean, somehow, if you have a uh, if you have a non-connective ring spectrum, you can somehow co-truncate to look at the connective covering, but but you cannot say anything. I mean, even also for K-theory in general, it's it's not so not so easy to control what the what the difference is. No, but is there a, con a truncation like it's going from C to pi zero? Is it having only the homo the non-positive homotopy? Does it, does it give you something? Uh, it gives a, a, a step in the post I don't know exactly the. Uh, does it give a ring spectrum or is all the. If you, would you, would you want to do what? So, so you so passing from C to pi zero C. Yes. So does it generalize the non connective? No. There's, there's no ring map from, from C to pi zero of C of C is. Uh, no, don't take pi zero C, but just take the pi. Ah. Yeah, yeah, you can somewhat. Ah, now I understand. You you replace this here by by the truncation in degrees less or equal to zero. Yes. Okay, then there's a ring map, but but even if if e is truncated, it's not a ring. Tau less or equal to zero. Ah. <laughs> because what you've got is not an ideal. The stuff you yeah. quotient by is not an ideal. So it's not a ring, so I mean, you are stuck in this. Yeah. You are stuck in this yeah. current point. Yes. Okay, so you are just the very beginning. You are. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. 
Um, okay, so, so we see, for example, we get excision for free, but let me first um, uh, somehow list the, the, the main uh, examples of this kind of uh, invariance. So examples, uh, the following. are truncating. Yeah, but even if it's not a ring, I mean, you have sort of a junction, I mean, you can still pass to a co-connected part. I mean, but, uh, but just no explicit formula. I mean, it's not just a truncating on the underlying thing, but... What? Yeah. I, I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, the inclusion of co-connected rings back yes. to all uh. admit sort of a junction. Right? Yeah, a joint. okay. So this is still a version of the question. Okay, I see. Uh, yes, but I, I cannot say anything about it. <laughs> but I want to check one thing. I mean, here, in, in that theorem, yes. you, you somehow, I mean, somehow localizing invariance, you value the inspector, but in, in the context of this theorem, does that hold for any, I mean, I mean, instead of spectra, you, any label in the category? I mean, for, for the target category, so uh, just this theorem, you say that any localizing invariant takes yes. that to yeah a condition square. I just wonder whether you really need need it to be spectrum or of whatever the target category of a localizing yeah, yeah. invariant is. Yes, so I just wrote this for the yeah yeah. I mean, but this 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 is by different. Okay. Yeah. If, if your localizing invariants by definition take values in stable categories, then it's true. Um, okay. So coming back to this question in particular, if you replace this AB and all these things by schemes, is there a version of excision in that case as well? Uh, we will come to this later. Um, I mean, so first, uh, yeah, I mean, maybe for now, you can, you, I can say, of course, because you also have Zariski descent, you can somehow, you can uh, reduce to the affine situation. And this, of course, gives you something for schemes. And, and then sometimes you get, uh, for example, for, for these truncating invariants, you, you get a CDH descent out of this. But this needs some, some more geometric input also. Okay, so let me let me list these these truncating invariants. So maybe the the most famous example is the the fiber of the cyclotomic trace, which is um, often denoted by K inv uh, invariant. So that's the fiber of the cyclotomic trace from K to T C, topological cyclic homology. Um, so uh, yeah, of cyclotomic trace. Um, and this is some of this famous theorem of Dundas, Goodwillie, and McCarthy. Uh, which says somehow, for example, um, now we get excision for this, and this means if you, so, so K theory does not satisfy excision, so it does not send Milner squares to pullback squares, but the failure of doing so is the same in K theory and, and in TC. And because sometimes you can effectively compute TC, um, this somehow gives you, gives you, I mean, lets you compute something about K theory of this Milner squares. Okay, so this, this is the first and most famous example, I think. And then there are some, some others. Uh, no, this is already on the top. Yeah. Uh, this was probably not a good idea. Um, Okay, anyway, let's try. <laughs> on, on, on this one here? Ah, I mean this, okay, the, the theorem of Dundas Goodwill and McCarthy says that, I mean, there are some, some, I don't know, I mean, the first formulation is maybe just for discrete rings, if you have a discrete ring and a nilpotent ideal. Then the fiber of the cyclotomic trace uh, is invariant under this quotient by this nilpotent ideal, and but then somehow you can extend this to some some of the map this this map from from C to pi zero of C for a connected ring spectrum. This is, I mean, you should think of this like a, an analog of of uh, modding out by a nilpotent ideal, and this is actually what they I mean what they prove is even if you have a surjection of uh, of connective ring spectra, uh, I mean. A map of connective ring spectra, which is on pi zero a surjection with new potent kernel, then um, then 
uh, 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 this k in uh, sent this to an equivalence. Um, yeah, so in particular, if you have the, the map from c to pi zero of c, this satisfies these con conditions and, and, and you get this equivalence. And I mean, I, this, is, this is a deep theorem. I mean, this is, this is one of the, uh, I don't know, I mean, main, main technical results or main results about, about trace methods. Um, I mean, there's a big book where, where this is proven, so I, don't, can, I cannot say anything about the proof of this right now. <laughs> Was it formulated originally in this generality of connected ring spectrum, or was it something more? Uh, so I think McCarthy proved it for simplicial rings, and then Dundas found some argument to, to deduce the general case of connective ring spectra from this case of simplicial rings, if I understand correctly. And then, I don't know if there's, if there's I, I think now maybe we have a more direct proof for, for connective ring spectra. I don't know. Yes. So it seems like. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah. they, they prove it after P completion, right? And then Goodwillie adds in the rational part. Ah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which was, I mean, done earlier. <laughs> yeah. So, so okay, but but in in this book by these three authors, the, you you find the integral version. Yeah, yeah. So the rational part was was proven earlier by Good Good Willy. Yeah. Uh, okay. More, more comments, questions. <laughs> okay. Let, let's come to the second example. And ah, yeah. This is this was also, is also due to Good Willy. So if you look at uh, periodic cyclic homology over Q. Um, and by this I mean you restrict all your th all your uh, things to, to Q algebras and all your categories to some some Q linear categories. Um, then you can define periodic cyclic homology, and this is also truncating. This is also by Goodwillie. Um, but it's important to work over Q. Um, and then there's a third example that maybe also plays a role. Sometimes you can. At least if you're over the integers, you can look at something called homotopy K-theory, this, uh, this Weibel's homotopy K-theory. Homotopy K-theory. So this is just defined by, I mean, algebraic K-theory is not A1 invariant, but you can somehow by some, some trick force it to be A1 invariant, and the result is this homotopy K-theory. And then if you do this, force the homotopy invariant, you see you also kill all the higher um, homotopic information somehow. This is what this says, that this is truncating. Um, and I don't know where this was first proven. And um, the last example, which is also quite classical, is that uh, if, you, if you look at K-theory and you invert something like rationalize or just invert one prime number P, then you also get some truncatingness properties. So uh, for example, K-theory with a prime P inverted uh, this is truncating um, as long as you restrict to to algebras where where p is to rings where p is nilpotent, so it's, uh, it's truncating on uh, z mod p to the n algebras. And, th and this, I think, was also first proven by Weibel. Okay. So sorry, I have a question. Yes. Can you um, say, compare with uh, the first example and the, the third example? I mean, is there have a map between these two? Uh, um, I mean, there is, yeah. Uh, I mean... Um, so the Weibel homotopy character is it defined just for the case of, of rings or, oh, or, yeah, or is it defined on, on uh, the more general infinity categories of some? Let's let's say we restrict to really to to z linear things, z linear things, so that we can use the standard the standard simplicial polynomial ring over over the integers that similarly appeared yesterday in Moritz's talk. Ah, in the last talk. Yeah, 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 yeah. yes, yes. Okay, but the a localizing invariant, if I understood correctly, is refers to something in your talk, previous talk where it was first defined on some. So yes, but yeah, yeah. This was, was just for, to simplify. I mean, you, you can always you can always fix some base, let's say base e infinity ring, 
and then only consider thing, thing or even more general but but let's say some some base e infinity ring and you you consider only algebras over this base ring and and all your categories should be then linear over this base ring or well, this makes sense and and you never somehow all this works also in this uh, slightly more general setting and k actually is defined for category some infinity category linear over so, so I mean, k for 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 usual algebraic k theory is just defined for any stable infinity category. This doesn't does not depend on. on and kh is defined for. Uh, yeah, at least for because some of the the formula for kh is given by this. Uh, you you look at this the standard simplicial ring z delta dot, and so you want to you want to have something that you can tensor over z with this z delta dot. Um, yeah. So that also works for, for ring spec, uh, for spec yeah. spectrum, uh, I guess just, so. just so for the uni that is flat. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You can you can do yeah you can do something over the sphere spectrum. Yes. And also okay. for for stable infinity categories, right? I just do the tensor product too. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. Sorry. So now there was a question on the relation between <laughs> one and three. <laughs> Um, and uh, yeah, this will come up again in, in Aiden's talk, I think. <laughs> so so let me not go too much into it right now. Uh, um, I mean, the, the point is somehow that you can form a that, that you also have the map from, from KT to KH and to N to TC, then this, this one fiber is, uh, is truncating. And, uh, and, and it follows that you get a Cartesian square where you have some more K theory and uh, KH theory, but you need, you need a bit more, and TC and G CDH, C55 TC. So this, this will come up in Alan's talk again. Um, okay, uh, good. Um, okay, so now, now let me just, I mean, I mentioned this before, but I didn't uh, write it. So if E is truncating, uh, then the following holds. So first of all, uh, uh, E satisfies Milner excision. So this means uh, uh, e of a Milner square as Cartesian, and this this we discussed already. This is this is easy. Then the second one is um, so here, for example, for the stoner scott and Carthy theorem, we said they proved it even for uh, they just required that the map on pi zero is surjective with nilpotent kernel. And this is in fact a consequence of being truncating that you also have this invariance under nilpotent ideals. So if um, if I and A, let's say, is a nilpotent ideal, uh, then E of A to uh, E of A mod I is an equivalence. And uh, this is maybe not completely clear. It's not I mean, from, from the definition. How, so how do you see this? Um, oh, can I? Can I use this? So the point is that it, um, if you can, of course, but, but, I mean, i is important, so you can reduce to to i squared being zero, and then you write you, you write this this a here and mod out by um, by i, so a mod i and a mod i, and so so a is then a square zero extension of of a mod i, and this means that you can write it down a, a pullback square, so so this original one. Uh, this B prime is now a non-discrete non ring, which has some A mod i in degree zero and A mod i in degree one. And one of, one of these maps is the trivial one. The other one is precisely given by this extension that you have. And, and then for this situation, you get, get such a ring C. And then you just compute that, that all these rings that you have here have pi zero equal to A mod i. And then by this truncating property, all these maps become equivalences. And then you see, because the inner one is Cartesian, you see that also this uh, vertical map, for example, must be an equivalence, which was the one from E of A to E of A mod I. So this, this also follows easily from, from this uh, theorem. And then the... the uh, it's only important. So because we have filtered, could limit of the important ideas. Then it's, this is not true. 
for, for Neil, I mean, if, if only the ideal is Neil, Neil ideal, so every element is Neil potent, of course you can write it as a filtered co-limit, but we do not require this, that our localizing invariants commute with filtered co-limits. And it's explicitly wrong for the fiber of the cyclotomic trace, for example. This you can, can compute in examples. Uh, it's not compared with the filtered, okay. I mean, a K theory commutes with filtered cone limits, but TC does not unless you mod out by some integer. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, and the, the last one I wanted to mention is that this CDH thing. So, um, okay, uh, let me say E ah. satisfies, sorry. Uh, CDH descent, um, and I will, I mean, this will also, also play a role in, in Elton's talk, and I will come back to this, I think, tomorrow. Um, so, but, so in particular, this means, we, got, we, we know already that E satisfies Nisnevich descent just because it's localizing, and, and then the only thing that's missing is that if you have an abstract blow-up square, if uh, X, no, what, what was it, uh, Y prime to Y, x prime to x, uh, yeah. So this this is one of the commutative squares that you see on the poster of this uh, summer school here. Um, if this is an abstract blow up, blow up, which means that uh, um, that these horizontal maps are closed immersions, and the map from x prime to x uh, is proper. And an, and an ISO outside uh, outside this closed thing here, outside Y. Uh, yeah, so you form the complement, then you have an isomorphism. And this is a so-called abstract blow-up square. And then usually you also put some finiteness condition here, um, which I'm, in the Noetherian case, you don't, I mean, you don't need this, but in the non-Noetherian non setting, you only allow, I think, maybe finitely presented here and also finitely present maps here. Um, then, then, uh, e, yeah, I mean, let's, let's call it the star, this diagram, then E of star is Cartesian. And, um, so this, this needs a little bit of, of geometric input. The main, the, the main point is that somehow you can build up any abstract blow-up squares by just using so-called, um, yeah, okay, by, by using blow-ups, I mean usual blow-ups, uh, so x, you blow up x in some closed sub-scheme, and, and basically finite Milner squares, or, or even closed coverings, so which, I mean, not, not precisely Milner squares, but, but almost, which, which can be somehow covered by this first point here. So you need to stand, understand something about blow-ups, and this you can in fact reduce to, uh, to blow-ups in regularly immersed centers. And then for that situation, you, you can really compute some of the derived category of, of coherent, uh, quasi-coherent modules on, on, on your blow-up. And then using techniques that I explained yesterday, you, you get this for, for in this situation somehow. And then you put... Are, are these implicitly some derived schemes or also...? Uh, I mean, so this here, in, in this statement, I mean, as, as you wish, so you can, I mean, the statement is for, for let's say, classical schemes, but in, in the process of, of proving this, you pass through some derived schemes in between. So you, you, if you have an, I mean, for example, you do something like you, you, uh, you have some... But, uh, but, but the word truncating in, uh, assumption implies that uh, the derived structure doesn't affect it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, by, by this truncatingness, you can more or less always forget about derived things. But, but nevertheless, I mean, what, what you do is you, uh, let's say you have some closed subscheme which is defined by finitely many equations, then this gives you a map to, 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 to affine space. And then you take uh, the, the usual, I mean, blow up of affine space in, in zero, which is regularly, reg, reg, I mean, in a regular uh, center. And then you uh, take the derived pullback of the situation uh, to X. So then you get some, something you derived, and for, in, for these kind of derived blow-ups, you can always compute, uh, and I mean any localizing invariant, not just for this. You don't need this truncating business, but then you can somehow pass to the underlying scheme, which is then not the blow-up, but something different, 
uh, using the truncatingness. Okay. Okay. Uh, good. Yeah, this is basically what I what I sketched yesterday at the very end. This follows from this basic localization sequence that you have that, that like any and I mean you have this this Karubi sequence perf of x on u maps to perf on x uh, perf sorry perf of x on z on the closed stuff that maps to perf of x maps to perf on u, and if you compare this for some some elementary Nisnevich squares, somehow the 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 two. Uh, these Karubi sequences, you get Maya Vitoris for, for Nisnevich for Nisnevich squares, elementary Nisnevich squares. I mean it's, it's really the same argument that I indicated for for Maya Vitoris for Tsiriski. Okay. Uh, good. Um, I wanted to say something how you prove this. And this needs one more uh, one more input. So so what is the idea roughly? Um, so, so, ye so somehow yesterday we always had this situation that we have some bow-speed localization and then we look at the kernel and then it could be compactly generated or not and if, if it's compactly generated then, then we, we won somehow. And here the situation is a, a little bit different um, because if you look at such a square of rings there's, I mean, and the induced functors on, on perfect complexes or perfect modules there's no reason for any one of them to be to be a Karubi localization, a, a Karubi quotient. Yeah. Um, so so we need to to do something different. And uh, what you see is uh, maybe let's write this here idea. Uh, so we want to have a Cartesian square e of a to uh, e of b, e of a prime, and then here e of c. And uh, of course, then by elementary operations, this, that this is Cartesian, uh, this is equivalent to uh, to the following: that if you look at e of a, and then you go to this to the sum of the two here, e of a prime plus e of b, and then you go to e of c, that this is a fiber sequence. Okay, so this is completely elementary. So here you take like the diagonal and then the, the difference of the two maps, and uh, so so this is ooh, sorry, <laughs> this is really what you have to um, uh, cook up somehow, and now you see what what is the idea. So the idea is to construct some category uh, whose whose k theory or e theory is precisely this this sum here, and then you hope that that the perfect uh, modules over A somehow map fully faithfully into this category. And then you can just take the Verdier quotient or the Karubi quotient, and the result will at least be a category which sits in this fiber. I mean, so that if you evaluate E, this will give you this fiber sequence. And and but at the end we want we really want to have a ring here because this is somehow uh, useful as we saw in these applications to get better control. And and to get this 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 follows from the schwede shipley theorem. So let me discuss this briefly. The Shipley theorem, uh, and this is somehow the uh, Morita theory for for um, for ring spectra, and and this is the recognition theorem when some some stable presentable category is the category of modules over some ring spectrum that we use here. So so let's consider such a category. So C is now a presentable uh, stable. Infinity category, and let's say we have we have one compact object, little c, and compact, which generates c, c generating um, c, in the sense that 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 if we look at the mappings, so that somehow homing out of this um, little c detects zero zero uh, zero objects. So if this is zero, then uh, D should be zero. So this is what I mean by by generating. And here's HOM is really the mapping spectrum. Okay. Uh, yes. Ah, yeah. Okay. Now we have such an object, and then we can uh, then we have the following theorem. Yeah. Uh, so I assume we have one such compact generator. Then there's a there's an equivalence of C with the 
um, category of modules, right modules, over the endomorphism ring spectrum of this little c. Okay, so now that's some compactly generated stable infinity categories presentable with, with one compact generator are precisely categories of modules over a ring spectrum. Um, and uh, yeah, so here, so yesterday I used the notation D of A for the derived infinity category of, of some discrete rings. But now somehow this is already a ring spectrum, so this somehow this is now taken by the category of mod, just module spectra over this ring spectrum. Uh, okay, let's uh, indicate how you prove this, or let's prove it. Um, okay, so we first of all construct a canonical functor from one side to, ah, let me maybe abbreviate this uh, endomorphism ring spectrum also to R. So this is an algebra and spectra. Um, then we have a canonical functor from the left to the right, this is called a G, from uh, C to right modules over this ring spectrum R, just given by sending uh, an object D to uh, the mapping spectrum in C from C, this was our generator, to D. Okay. So th this is a functor, and uh, because yeah, so this ha this gets the right action of uh, of the endomorphisms because we have this C here, okay? and and now we see what 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 properties does this functor have? So then uh, G is uh, first of all preserves our limits. So the idea is to do, to use the adjoint functor theorem to construct an inverse and then check that this is, I mean, to, to construct an adjoint functor and then check that it's really an inverse. So this preserves all limits just because d is somehow in the second variable. Um, but now we use the assumption that c is compact. So by definition, this implies that this functor here also commutes with filtered co-limits. And then again, because we are in a stable setting, we see that it preserves also all uh, co-limits. And, and finally, you also want to see what, what does this condition here, this generating condition, give that says that, okay, so if uh, d maps to zero here, then d was already zero. So in other words, um, this means, this implies that g is conservative. Okay, so this is implied by, this, by these assumptions. And then now it's, it's completely formal, so... Uh, so by the first property that it preserves all limits, the adjoint functor theorem implies that there exists a left adjoint. F, so maybe let's indicate it here. Uh, F is uh, a left adjoint, yeah. And uh, so the claim is somehow this F sends the, so, so the, the category on the right hand side here, this has a canonical compact generator, which is R itself, this ring. And the claim is this R sends, uh, F sends our generator R to this, this chosen generator C. So let's compute this. Uh, so, so for this, we just look at the following. So we compute Hormann C from F of R to any D. By, by adjointness, we can also write this here as a HOM in R module, so HOM over R, let's say, of uh, from R to, to the right adjoint G, applied to D. But now you see that you, you are in R modules, hom homing out of R, this just means you just look at the underlying spectrum of this G of D. And what is this? Um, by definition, G of D is uh, this, this functor evaluated on D, so it's precisely HOM uh, home in C from C to D. Okay, so, so these two things are equivalent and then, then you see from the Yoneda lemma, so now Yoneda implies that, that this F of R has to be equivalent to C. Okay, so that produces a, a, map, a map first of all and, and then and this has to be an equivalence. Okay. Uh, good. So, so this already implies that implies what? Uh, yeah, so, so this implies that if we now apply G again, G composed with F on R, 
uh, this, this is now g of c and this was just uh, r. So in other words, what we see is that the, um, the unit of this adjunction, so identity to uh, g composed with f, the unit map at eta, and this is an, this is an equivalence uh, on the generator, on the generator R. This is what this says here. And now because, again, similar as, as yesterday, these functors here both commute with all co-limits, and the category of modules is generated under all co-limits um, by R. So we see it's in, so, so by this co-limit, so co-limit co preservation. Oh. Hmm. Um, this implies that uh, eta is an equ equivalence. Okay, so now we have already that the uh, unit of the adjunction is an equivalence. But then you, you can use the, so we want to show that also the co-unit is an equivalence. And this is where we use this conservativity here. So the, the usual triangle equalities, no, how is it called, triangle identities for an adjunction, um, they imply that, uh, now if you look at the unit, uh, sorry, the, the co-unit, F composed with G to, to the identity on C, um, uh, if you apply the right adjoint again, then this has to be an equivalence. Uh, this follows from these triangle uh, identities because one of them is the, the, the somewhere you have the unit which is, an, which is an equivalence and then you have some identity and the, the third leg somewhere is this one so this also has to be an equivalence and now because G is conservative we see that so by the conservativity uh, G conservative this implies that epsilon is an equivalence Ah, yeah. and, and so now we have finished this, this uh, proof of the Schwede Shipley recognition theorem. Uh, okay. This is for which year? Sorry, for? What year? What, which year? Yes. Oh, I have no idea. Uh, Schwede Shipley is. Uh, does anybody know when Schwede Shipley is? Uh, I mean, and also, of course, this was originally formulated for, for model, I mean, stable, stable model categories. And um, I mean, you find, an, find a proof in the infinity categor categorical version in Lurie's higher algebra. Um, yeah, but yeah, I don't know. <laughs> could, you, could you provide an example? Of the um, to see the left and right? Uh, yeah, I mean, yes, in the proof of the, of the main theorem, this will be used. So this is maybe a good example. Okay. Um, I mean, the, yeah, yeah. So I just looked it up, it's 2003. Ah. <laughs> so before, uh, before one could speak about this, before one could speak about the, the notion of uh, PRLS, yes. or maybe there was already a crib, already uh, in 2003 some papers. I, I, I guess that Royal's things maybe already existed at the time. The model PRL stable is by stable model categories. <laughs> model for PRL is like model categories, and well, I guess then stable model. Okay. Um, uh, good. So now let's come to the proof of the that's the main theorem, which uh, um, this one up there. Uh, okay, so I, I already said what the idea is. We want to cook up some, some categories some whose, whose E theory is given by the sum n such that, that the perfect A modules fully faithfully embed into this. And actually, ah, yeah, this idea comes somehow from this original proof by, by Bass and, and Milner of, the, of this excision sequence. Because what they prove, I mean, they work with finitely generated projective modules. And they prove that the, if you have such a Milner square, then the category of finitely generated protective A modules is just the pullback 
of the other categories. But in general, somehow K theory is not well behaved with pullbacks of categories. This is why this somehow not easily uh, extends. But um, nevertheless, somehow this this is precisely the idea. So what what is a, the pullback of this? Corresponding categories of perfect modules, this would consist of a module here, one module here, and an equivalence if you base change both to, to ah, not to C, but to, uh, to this B that we started with. Okay? And, and the idea is just we, we relax this condition on, on this, this, third, this third component, this map being an equivalence. So, um, so what we do is so, so consider uh, a diagram. In uh, let's say in cut perf uh, infinity of the following form um, a prime. So now I, I write these curly letters for for these categories, and you should think as example as perfect modules over a prime. Um, uh, we have functors to b prime and b. Uh, let's call this one p and this one q. Then we define. Um, Something called the the, the lax pullback or oriented fiber product. What is cut perf? So, which one is it? Cut infinity perf. You mean? Yeah, that's the category of Kerr-Ruby complete small stable idempotent complete infinity categories. But I, I mean, this actually does does not matter for this definition. I mean, this this definition you can do it in complete generality for any diagram of infinity categories. But at the end, I mean, I want to apply it in the situation of uh, of this. Yeah. Yeah, or cut infinity. Uh, so we define um, a prime and then pull back over b prime, but with this orientation here, this b, uh, with objects. Um, so an object should be a, um, a, a pair x of an object here in a prime, and then y is an object in b. And then you have some comparison map here uh, between the so p of x to q of y. So this this is a map in C. And I mean this 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 is easily made uh, precisely. I mean of course I cannot define a category by just saying what its objects are, but it's an easy exercise to write this write down a precise uh, definition, infinity categorical, or with the model of quasi categories. Um, Okay, so that's that's a definition, and um, uh, so we want to apply this somehow in this situation. And then the first the first observation is um, there always exists a split Kerr-Ruby sequence, or even Verdier sequence. Or there's there's no need to to idempotent complete anywhere, um, um, namely from so this uh, category B, thus uh, fully faithfully includes into this oriented fiber product. So, sorry, you write that arrow belongs to C. What is C? I mean, so so you apply the functor P. Yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, here. So this this the inclusion which somehow sends an object Y. So just the zero object in the first category, then we take y, and then there's because this goes to a zero object. Uh, because these okay in this setting the functors are exact, so so send zero object to zero objects. So there's a, there's only one choice for this map, which is the zero map. Um, and then there's a canonical map to a prime, which is just uh, the the projection on the first component. And so this first of all you check easily. This is a Kerr-Ruby sequence. And, and this somehow is simplified by the fact that these uh, even have adjunctions. So we saw this in the case of, of presentable categories. The, the, the existence of right adjoints is quite helpful to check that something is a localization sequence. And here it even exists on this level of small categories. And it's just given, for example, here it's the projection. Ah, yeah. Let's call this maybe I to second inclusion. Then here's the projection, and here's the inclusion in the first component i one. These are the uh, right adjoints. Okay, so we have this uh, somehow Kerr-Ruby sequence, which also has um, splittings, 
And then you see that if you apply any localizing invariant, this, this tells you that this on, on this oriented fiber product, it's just the direct sum of the two here because you get some of fiber sequences which are split. So in particular, oh, okay, it's here. you get E of this uh, Lex pullback. It uh, just depends on E of A prime plus E of B. Okay? So, so when you say split, you only mean split in one direction. You don't have the left joint. Uh, I mean, it's enough to have some uh, one function in this direction, and the composite is the uh, the identity here. Yeah. So it's kind of we can uh, swap the a and the a prime b. Where we could give get another se uh, sequence. Yeah, uh, I think. But then, then the okay. Yes, this. I think you can do this. But then the. Uh, then the formula for the adjoint is more complicated, if I remember correctly. It's definitely, yeah. Uh, I actually forgot how this, how this is precisely, but I, I know that this is somehow the easiest way to write down such a Kerbovi sequence. Um, yeah. OK. Um, Wait, just the follow. Did they, they left the joint and right adjoint? The left adjoint or right adjoint? I mean, from, from right adjoint. The left. horizontal maps are left adjoint, and the upper ones uh, are supposed to be the right adjoints. Okay. I mean, all maps are horizontal, sorry. I mean, the one from. <laughs> 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 the one from left to right are left adjoint, and the one from right to, li to left are right adjoints. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, so, so now we have already arrived somehow at the, at the candidate for our category. And now it's it's easy to check that um, another observation. Ah, yeah, and also you see that if uh, this this lax pullback here, the oriented fiber product, this has a subcategory where where you require this map in B prime to be an equivalence, and that's precisely the pullback. Yeah, so so the, the pullback always sits fully. Fa I mean, as a full subcategory inside, and and uh, now we apply this in our situation. So we have a perf of a, there is a canonical functor, exists a canonical functor uh, to the to this lex pullback of of the other two other three things. Um, perf uh, of B prime and then perf of B. Um, just by this, just um, by by somehow extending scalars from A to A prime and to to B. And then if you further extend to B prime, there's a canonical equivalent. So this even lands in the in the pullback here of these categories. And I mean, for this, you don't even need that this original square was Cartesian. This you always have for any commutative square of, of, of ring spectra. And then you check that uh, this here is in fact, uh, this factor here is fully faithful. Um, in fact, if and only if the original square box was Cartesian. Um, yeah, so this is a simple computation because this basically this is generated by A and then you look at the image of A and and someone just check. You just have to compute what the endomorphisms of, of the image of A in this category are and this is precisely the pullback A prime and B over B prime. And so you see uh, yeah this this you see this claim here. So here, perfectly actually maps to the straight pullback. Right? Really to the pullback, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it it is precise. It turned, in this situation, it it is precise the pullback. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's uh, let's call this I, this canonical fully faithful inclusion here, and then we just define uh, define um, C as the uh, Karubi quotient. Or in other words, it's the cofiber of I in, in cut perf. So this Karubi quotient uh, so of of I. So by this I mean I mean take this lax this oriented fiber product and then take the quotient by this category and then item put and complete. Okay. Um, good. Now we want to apply this Swedish Shipley theorem. So we need 
okay, this was maybe done in a stupid way because <laughs> I formulated this here for presentable stable infinity categories and now I was working with small categories. But this doesn't matter, we can just pass to the incompletion here, then we arrive at A modules and at the incompletion here and it turns out that incompletion commutes with this with these uh, oriented fiber products yeah so incompletion does not commute with fiber products in general but it does with these uh, oriented fiber products um, so we can somehow replace uh, all these categories by the big module categories and then we all know already that int of c will be the just the the, the verdier quotient of this of this map on on of this functor on the, on the level of categories so we can, in fact, apply this schroeder shipley theorem and then pass back to, to compact objects. Um, Sorry, the map I, is that this canonical map? It's this one, yeah. yeah. So, so at the end, we have some Kaobi sequence where we have C here. That's the co uh, OK, so what we need is a canonical, or some, I mean, not canonical, but we need some generator for the C. And, um, now, if you look at this, so these categories of modules over a ring are always generated by the ring itself. So this one is generated by A prime. This one is generated by B. And then it's easy to see that the whole category is generated by the two objects somehow. One which is A prime zero zero. So just A prime in the first component zero else. And then the second one has just the B in the second component and zero anywhere else. Um, so, so it's generated by these two objects, but they live in a, so you have a fiber sequence because you can also look at the image of A in this category here. And then you have a canonical map to, uh, uh, from some of the image of A, I think, to, to this, to the object A prime zero zero. And, and the fiber is precisely given by, by zero, um, by, 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 by some of, uh, zero B zero. Okay, uh, so so let me okay let me make it. So this here is uh, generated by. I should have written this in the beginning. I think this would have been easier. This and uh, zero B zero, and we have a fiber sequence which relates the two. And in the middle, uh, we have some of the image of A, which is A prime B, and then the canonical isomorphism B prime. Uh, to be prime. Okay, so so this is, uh, and I think this maps to. I hope this is. Uh, what did I say? No, to a prime. Uh, I, yeah, I think it should go like this. And zero comma b comma zero. So we have this fiber sequence, and in C we we have mod out the image of of perfect complexes over A. So this goes to zero. So we see that the two, the, the images of these two, two generators are somehow the same up to a shift. So in other words, uh, so this implies that C is generated by, let me briefly write this here, uh, by the image of, and let's call this image B bar of zero B zero. So do you know that somehow generator, if you have a generating set, and you form this Verdier quotient, then it goes to a generating. Yes. Set. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. This this is not not hard to show. So. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, no. I have five minutes left. Ah, yeah. Okay. But now we are almost done. So let me maybe delete this one here. Okay, so now we can apply this schroeder shipley theorem. So maybe we pass to, to incompletions and then back to, to compact objects. Uh, so schroeder shipley oops, implies now that uh, C is equivalent to the perfect uh, object, perfect complexes over the endomorphisms of our preferred generator B bar. So just remains to com to compute this 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 guy here, uh, and this is what we then this is uh, what we then denote by uh, this capital C. This will will be our our ring spectrum. 
Okay. This now already has all the required properties, so it sits in this in the square there. I mean, this of course there's a little bit to check, but that's not so hard. It also has a canonical map to B prime. This this comes from the fact that there's you can always you have a functor from from this uh, oriented pullback to B prime by taking the cofiber of this of this third component map there. Um, so you have all the maps. Um, Ah, yeah, and then because this here is, by definition, uh, this one, because this one is a Karubi sequence, it's also clear that if you apply any localizing invariant, you get uh, E of A and then here the sum of E of A prime and B. This we, uh, that's written here in the shadow. And then comes E of C. That's, that's precisely what we want. And the only missing thing is to compute the underlying spectrum of, of the C. So only uh, remains to compute uh, the, the, the underlying spectrum uh, of C and uh, three minutes so I can even I think finish this computation um, or I can yeah mm. Yeah, let me j maybe just just indicate how you compute this. So we have the, uh, so we can pr we can pass to, of course, somehow to compute the endomorphism spectrum, we can pass to incompletions. Because, I mean, this is just the full subcategory of its incompletion. So and then it becomes easier because we get get a right adjoint functor somewhere. So we have the the modules over A. This maps uh, fully faithfully into uh, the int com yeah into. Let me just write this. Lex pull pull back uh, with the corresponding categories here, and then this goes to the incompletion of C. And I want to have a so so we know already that this functor has a right adjoint, and I want to get an explicit formula for this. And then it's also somewhat general nonsense, so uh, or general uh, I mean formal. So this one of course also has a right adjoint. Um, let's this was called I, and this let's call it uh, S. I call this one P, and the right adjoint here I call R. And the point is that um, this right adjoint here is always, or the, let, let's say, the corresponding localization functor. So if you start with the, uh, here in the oriented fiber product, then project down and go back with the right adjoint, that's the so-called localization functor. This is always given as the cofiber of the uh, unit or co-unit of this adjunction. So let's get it right. Um, so then uh, R composed with P, this is equivalent to the cofiber of, uh, okay, this is the right adjoint, so it's probably identity, no, it's I, sorry, it's the left adjoint, I composed with S, uh, then I have the co-unit of this adjunction to, to identity, the identity on this oriented fiber product. Um, and this is just general nonsense. And the point is that uh, all these functors here are explicit. So for S, we can just write down uh, what, so there's an explicit formula for S, namely S of such a pair X, Y, and some map uh, F, let's call it G maybe. Uh, this you can compute as follows. There's, so this is, this is the pullback. Um, so you, you take X and then we have also have Y. Mm. Uh, and this has this has a map to the base change. I mean, B to tensor. Uh, this is a right B module, and the base change to B prime. This was what this formula does. And then here, similarly, you have a map from X to the scalar extension to B prime. Uh, X tends out over A prime with B prime, and then you have this cannot, this comparison map G here. So somehow you can compose this this is induced by G, and then you just take the take the pullback. Uh, of this diagram, yeah. So, so this object here is, is what this uh, what this S is, um, and then then you can just compute this on this generator, uh, and this is all very easy. And I leave it as an exercise to finish this computation. So now it's it's easy uh, computation. Okay. So that finishes the proof of this theorem and also my talk for today.
Thank you so much. Questions? What happens if you revert the, your ambition? Um, you get the same C or? No, no. Uh, so in general, I, I think uh, we have an example where when you change the orientation, you get something which is not equivalent to the to the original one. So it really depends on the the C. It depends on the orientation. Uh, if these rings are E, infinity is is this like the tensor product or, or the, the some other? Thing? No, that's also a good question. <laughs> Um, I mean, first of all, it should it's somewhat surprising that it, that you get a ring structure on the tensor product at all, and, and even if everything is e infinity, then uh, then the resulting ring structure will in general only be e one, and has nothing to do with the also existing e infinity ring structure on the on the tensor product. I mean, the only thing is on pi somehow in this connective case on pi zero, it's the correct one, but 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 in general they are quite different. I mean, it can happen even with even if you do this with discrete rings, so there's an example where you start with discrete rings. Also, this, this new ring C will be discrete in this example. And I mean, the rings that you start with are all commutative, but the, the, the resulting ring is non-commutative. If you just work with simplicial rings to simplify, possibly non-commutative, does this construction give you a simplicial ring or not? Yes. Yeah, yeah, the, uh, this, yeah, this, this, this is true. I mean, somehow you can you can stay always in this. I mean, simplicial rings are, I think, just uh, connective HZ algebras. Mm -hmm. So you mean can, you maybe if Gabba want to say commit, uh, simplicial commutative rings? No, then it's okay. No, no, then it's wrong. Uh, if you do simplicial commutative rings, I think then it's not true that. Oh, but what is the same as E one? Right? Yeah. What? So. No, I mean simplicial rings, yes. not commutative. I mean what is sometimes called associative. <laughs> so suppose you have a simplicial associative unit ring. Okay, <laughs> oh, simplicial rings, yes. which is a mean low square in the sense. Let us say that one map is really surjective yeah. term by term, so that you can take the yeah. fiber problem yeah. in yeah. naive sense. That you can also arrange it. I mean this is not yeah. uh, the problem. So 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 you have a model in terms of diagram of superficial ring yes. on the nose, and then your construction says that you take this derived tensor product. So of course, we know that we can compute it using resolutions uh, like in Illusi or whatever you mean. But this will only give you, uh, because you use left and right modules, it's not clear how you define the ring structure, I mean, the superficial ring structure of this. Is it the case that you can do it so that you can define a superficial ring structure on C? Ah, so so um, I mean, first of all, I know just just some of, because I know that that any connective HC algebra can be can be um, modeled by a simplicial ring. I know that in in your setting, the ring spectrum that I produce has a model which is a simplicial ring, but I I don't know if I can really write down an explicit. I've never thought about this. And HC algebra just means a map. From H Z to the uh, to the. Uh, I mean, it's no, it's more complicated because it's. Uh, I mean, we are looking at non-commutative things. So even in the classical setting, I mean, ah no, okay for okay in the classical classical setting, I think for for Z algebras, there's not a problem. But that's the same like the E one map from Z to, uh, to, to to some. No, no but a priori, yeah. I mean, Z maybe not. It's not central. Yeah. Ah, right. I mean, this in some of the classical rings, this disappears, this problem, but... Okay, so the a map, uh, so an HZ algebra is more than yes. just a map of, of ring spectrum yeah. from HZ to Z, because you want a kind of this to be like in the center, I mean... Yeah, yeah, precisely, yes. In the yeah. center. Yes. So, and this is, well, the, this is defined well, this notion. Ah, uh, I mean... I mean everything is in 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 higher in Lewis higher algebra. Of course, you find everything. Um, but I mean, this is definitely not the first place where these things were were um, defined. And I, I, I actually don't know what what is the maybe someone has a good reference where where these things were first defined. And you know that this what it was like is an HZ algebra because. 
Uh, yeah, th this is because somehow you, you could restrict everything from the beginning. As, as I said, also you can somehow fix a base, and if you fix the base, uh, the HC, uh, then, then we somehow all, the, all these constructions work in HC linear categories. And then also the schwede shipley theorem somehow works uh, HC linear. So, th I mean, this is, I think, more or less clear that but this, this, this endomorphism ring spectrum that we have there will be also an HC algebra then. So the base has to be a commutative, uh, it's what is called an infinity. Yeah, for example, yes, yes. So, the, yeah, so it's, I mean, it's maybe fair to say this theorem, the way you presented it is sort of in the absolute case of this. Yeah, yeah, okay. Relative mm. variance by every. Yeah, you can say it like this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I have a question about your truncating, truncating invariant. Truncating yes. thing. So, so a priori, your, your, your thing is only importing a condition on rings, but how would, do you see any consequences for, for, for stable infinity kind of rings? Um. Um, it, I mean, this, yeah, this is somehow a, a weird point, and I, I don't know. I mean, for, for example, I, I don't know how to formulate this, this property of being truncating only in terms of the, of the categories. And just like a thread or extension. You can formulate it in terms of base structures. <laughs> so ah. if you have a stable infinity category with a bounded base structure, then you have the additive heart, and you want to say there is this great complex functor, mm -hmm. and you want to say that the invariant induces an equivalence when invited. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Mm. yeah, thanks. Okay, so let's thank Georg again.